Welcome to a series of videos about the restoration of vintage drums from my personal collection. In this episode, we're looking at a bass drum that I obtained from a seller in Florida who bought it from an estate in New England. So let me tell you a little bit about this drum first. This is a style of bass drum that is sometimes referred to as a gong bass, and that's because of its shallow depth. There are reinforcement rings along the inside, and the counter hoops are made out of wood, and they would call this ebonized wood because it's painted black to resemble ebony. This drum dates back to the early 1900s, and the reason I know that is because the previous owner etched his name in the veneer on the outside of the bass drum. Now, I was looking for the brand of the drum and couldn't find it. I was carefully turning it around to try to see if there were perhaps remnants of a decal on the veneer, but I didn't find one. Instead, I saw a little glimmer of light. His name was Alfred Gardner, and he lived at 553 Broadway in Revere, Massachusetts. It's important to me to not only know who may have owned these drums, but to know what kinds of performances they may have been a part of. And so I looked into Alfred Gardner and found him on the 1900 and 1910 censuses living at that Broadway address in Revere, Massachusetts. By 1920, he had moved to a different home. In 1910, his occupation was shown as a cutter at a fish market, but we know he played music on the side. During this time frame, the early 1900s, drums were not manufactured to the same kinds of standards that they are today. And so this drum, being 25 and a half inches, is not unusual. What it means for us today is that the standard size of drum heads that are available for purchase from just about every drum head manufacturer can't be used. A custom drum head must be ordered. So let's talk about the tensioning system on this drum. This is a single rod tension drum, and by that I mean that there is only one tension rod that tightens both heads simultaneously, not like the independent tensioning that most modern drums today have. This tuning system is a little unusual given the fact that it requires a 5 16 wrench in order to tune the drums. These tension rods look different than most of the single rod tension drums in my collection because it's not a thumb rod and it's also not tuned with a typical drum key. Of the 10 tension rods on this drum, there's one that is special because this drum was designed for marching. This single tension rod has an eye on it in the center of the tuning mechanism and that is where the bass drummer would attach his harness. These tension rods are also unique in that one side is regularly threaded and the opposite side is reverse threaded. What that means is when two of the claws are attached and the tension rod is turned, that either they're both tightening or they're both loosening at the same time. And given that fact, it's helpful if all of the tension rods are running in the same direction so that counterclockwise is all either loosening or tightening and vice versa. For this restoration, I only needed a few parts. A simple calfskin head that was mounted on a flesh hoop. The flesh hoop didn't come with the drum when I purchased it, and so I had to have one custom made to the 25 and 5 eighths inches diameter because it was slightly out of round. So I had a custom drum head manufacturer prepare a flesh hoop as well as a calfskin head mounted on that custom flesh hoop. There were a few challenges that I can tell you about. First of all, we already spoke about the fact that the drum was out of round by just a little bit, but a little bit here and a little bit there, a little bit in the shell, a little bit in the counter hoop, and a little bit in the flesh hoop all has uh, an impact on putting the drum back together easily. And I expected that the drum head was going to be arriving in a sealed plastic bag, still a little bit moist to help maintain the shape of the flesh hoop, but that's not how it arrived. It arrived dry. It may have been shipped moist, but in the course of shipping, it warped. By moistening the calf skin head, I was able to allow that calf skin to relax just a little bit, which reduces the pressure on the flesh hoop. That, in addition to weights and clamps, helped to reduce the amount of warpage on the frame. And so here's where the real struggle started. For about an hour and a half, I was trying to work to align all of the out-of-round parts. 
and um, we're just working to kind of tug a little bit here, push a little bit there. A little bit of pressure applied in some different parts can help to get those pieces to snap back together. But then I went a little too far. I had my hand on the counter hoop and I was tugging it, just pulling it a little bit to help get it to seat properly when I heard this sound. And I knew I had to stop. So I investigated and I was really lucky to find out that all I had done was put enough pressure on the counter hoop to release the old bond of glue at the place where it joins together. Now that's going to be an easy fix, but the fact remains is that I still have to make that happen. So I'm going to be taking the counter hoop to a guitar repairman I know. And you might be thinking to yourself, a guitar repairman is going to be fixing a counter hoop. Well, here's the reason why. He's a master luthier, and he's been accustomed to working with curved wood pieces for a very long time. Once I get the word that this joint has been properly glued together and dried, I'll get the piece back from him and I can reassemble the drums. It's still a little tricky with just one person trying to get all of those single rod tension pieces together and all of the out of round pieces together. But once everything aligns, then you're in business. And that's the real world with drum restorations. It's not unicorns and glitter and rainbows. Real problems creep up that you didn't expect because there are natural tendencies in these organic materials to, to break, to crack, to warp, to flange outward, and they all can be overcome with patience and with the right kinds of tools. So check back. In the coming weeks, I'll have a video that shows the final playable drum. And in the meanwhile, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the flip side. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the East Central Regional Arts Council thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.